G'day Fights On folks, Aaron here and I want to welcome back a, a guest who's now been on, I think this must be at least the third time he and I have chatted and um, brought him back for another cool um, flying tale. So welcome, please welcome John Schreiber, call sign Hooter. <laughs> so welcome John, how are you going? Hey Aaron, how are you doing today? Great, <laughs> very well, good this morning, yourself? I'm, do I'm doing quite well. Um, two shots strong and uh, everything good. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Hooter and I were just discussing his um, limited exposure to the barber recently because of uh, COVID. <laughs> Last time I saw him, his hair was a lot shorter. <laughs> so anyway, what, you wanted to come on and t tell us uh, another tall tale, as it were. So um, how about I uh, change screens and we flip over to you and let you start the story. All righty. Let me know when you're ready. All right, thanks. All right, let's talk about a high density altitude takeoff from Biggs Army Airfield in El Paso, Texas. Not many of you have probably been there, but and I've only landed there. I think this was the only time I've ever landed there. <clears throat> it's literally just north of the commercial airport, and I don't think it's more than about five miles from the Mexican border. So it's a pretty tight confines there. But a, uh, I was just coming back from San Diego. I'd gotten 10 traps out on some boat, and I can't remember which one it was. It might have been the Kitty Hawk uh, in A4s. Uh, I was getting my CQ lead qualification. So I got t 10 traps for free over the 29th and 30th of uh, May, and then like April 2nd or whatever, um, we headed back. I had an instructor in the back seat with me, and I think he flew the leg into Biggs, and I flew the leg the rest of the way to Beeville, Texas. And this airplane that's on there right there, that's that was the paint scheme we had in our squadron up the VT-26 in Beeville. Um, and it's one number off of Two of the airplanes I flew, the tail, uh, the bureau number on this is 158712. I've got 158711 and 158713 in my logbook, but uh, I thought I'd put this one on here. So that's that's what we were flying in. You can go to the next So slide. just, go can ahead. I just ask you a question before I go? <clears throat> so were you, were you training as a student or were you in instructor training, like you were trained to be an instructor for this? What was the difference? Ah, good point. I was actually an instructor. Um, I think I had students going to this boat, but I was becoming qualified as a CQ lead. So I could take four students out to the boat in as a lead airplane. Uh, I, I was right. normally going out as an LSO, but this way we're going to let me fly with the students out there. There's just certain things you needed to do, and you had to get a qualification in your book on it. So I was I was a kind right. of instructor part of the time and a student part of the time. And then on the way back, the guy in the back was a lieutenant commander who had just gotten in the squadron. He was also going through the same sort of thing, and uh, I was doing some kind of check ride on him on the way from San Diego to uh, to uh, uh, El Paso. Right. Okay, cool. So, All right, so I'll go to the next slide for you. All right. All right. Now, what have we got here? Got, what I guess we have a here is the, uh, the airport diagram for Biggs Army Airfield. Fairly long runway, a little over uh, 13,400 feet at about 4,000 feet altitude. And that's the logbook entry on the uh, right side of the screen from my logbook. The guy's name was Ingram. And we got a 3.3. Uh, I got one landing out of it and we, we split it up. Uh, he, got, he flew front in to El Paso and I flew in the front going to, uh, to uh, Beeville. So I got right. to take off out of El Paso. And, you know, um, there's a lot of things you have to consider. Oh, and at the southwest end of the runway, uh, you can see there's some other stuff down there. Yeah, there's some some buildings over there. That wasn't there. It was just raw desert when when we were there. That that right. load 
wasn't there. So it was, we were just looking, you know, if we went down at the end of the runway, we'd, we'd just crash into dirt. So there wasn't anything scary. <laughs> okay. So it's maybe, a little maybe we can maybe we can call it up on uh, might call it up on Google Maps or something later and yeah. have a look at it. <laughs> so it's a little bit down slope, but like a 0.3% uh, uh, downhill kind of run, and like I said, thirteen thousand four hundred and fifty-five feet. So it should be enough runway. But being uh -huh. professionals, we went to the next page in our NATOPS manual. You can go to them. of course slide there um, cool. and you can see here this is the uh, the takeoff uh, diagram for the ta4 and uh, with the uh, p6 engine and you start at the top and you take your gross weight uh, your takeoff weight which was about 21,000 pounds and that'll tell you what your takeoff airspeed is going to be and it, it was about 150 knots and then you wind okay. your way through this nomograph and go to the bottom and you find that it's going to take about 4,500 feet takeoff roll. Yep. But it also goes through a hatched area there um, in the uh, the middle of the screen that, uh, I mean, middle of the that. chart, that hatched area says, hey, you might be overweight. So there's another chart you have to check to make sure that we weren't overweight. We weren't going to overspeed the tires. The tire speed is... 175 knots or something. So we're going to be airborne at 150 or so we hoped. And then to do a speed check, you, you go over to, I went to 2,500 feet. So after 2,500 feet of roll or the 11 board, uh, we were going to see about 116 knots. So, you know, that, that takes a little while to do because you, you know, this is done with pressure altitude and you got to, yeah, you know, just got to figure out a bunch of different things and do conversions, uh, blah, blah, blah. So, so we, we did that. And then uh, go to the next page. Uh -huh. And there's more charts, refusal speeds, stopping distances in different configurations. So there's another chart on the next page, another three charts on the next page. Right. Here we are looking at this who's not been in the Navy flying, probably going, what the heck? <laughs> exactly. So you wind your way through all these charts to find out, you know, are you going to get off the uh, the runway? And if you can't, are you going to stay on the runway? And, and so yeah. that's, that's kind of the process for figuring this stuff out. Go to the next page. We didn't do any of that. <laughs> Oh, okay. Broke the rules, did we? <laughs> Not really. The, the, and this is an important point. You see that red arrow up there? That yeah. red arrow is pointing to a thing called the exhaust pressure ratio gauge. If you, you calculate that, and it's pretty easy to do, and I'll show you that in a second. But notice the little gauge off to the right from the exhaust pressure ratio gauge. That's the oil pressure. Yeah. So yeah. which one do you think is more important, the EPR or the oil pressure? <laughs> it's obviously oh. the EPR. It's the bigger gauge. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So Who it needs oil pressure. Yeah. You can you can you barely see the oil pressure in daylight, let alone at night, and you have to lean over. And you'll mm -hmm. notice that, that EPR is off to the, the right a little bit from center line. It's a small cockpit, yeah. but you do get a little bit of parallax when you look at it. So we looked up the what's our EPR going to be for this particular day. And you can't check that until you're at mill power on the runway and just starting to roll. So go to the next slide. Yeah. Let me get there. So I blew up the EPR a little bit, and that's what it looks like. And you can set the bug down on the lower left corner. You can set the number in there that you want. And this, these numbers, and it goes from like 1.2 up to 3.5 or something like that. And that's comparison of the uh, uh, barometric pressure outside of the airplane, basically the pitot pressure that the airplane knows about. 
and the N1 turbine compressor. I think that's a second stage in the, the turbine. Uh, not, not the compressor, I'm sorry, but in the turbine. Uh, and it's supposed to be, in this particular case, just a little bit over 2.25. Just under 2.25. Because yep. it was... It was not quite 90 degrees. I, I, I think I might have, uh, I think it was around 30 degrees C, whatever it turns into Fahrenheit wise. So about 2.25 is what we were going to be looking for. And there's, a, there's one of these in the front seat and the back seat. Okay. So we go through our, our takeoff checks and everything. You know, uh, we, we'd landed there, we got gas. Uh, we talked about hot and high. And he goes, you know, 13,000 feet, what's a big deal? So, hold on, helicopter. Uh, there goes an attack squadron of Apaches. Yeah. So, so we, um, you know, and I've got some NATOP stuff uh, that, that tells you how important all this kind of stuff is. So this really tells you whether or not you're going to get airborne. Uh, you, can okay. do, you can do all those other things if you want to. Uh, and if someone were to ask you after an accident, you will say that you did all those things. But this is what you really, <laughs> really concern yourself with. Right. So go to the next page. No worries. And I'll just, this is the cockpit. I'm just showing you context. The, the little blue square up in the top right corner is um, where those two gauges are, the EPR and the oil gauge. I, I put this on there for the people yep. who want to look at what's in the cockpit so if they want to freeze this screen take a copy of it they can see it and and it'll be good for them i assume this diagram is in the natops anyway would that be right it is in the natops i think this is fold out two or fold out three right okay uh, got a mail delivery so the back to the effort well, well as soon as the mailman drives off the dog will stop the, the, it's a universal thing with dogs. I, yeah, I, I'm embarrassed to admit it, but I was a, a postman for about four and a half years and dogs were eternally annoying as far as that goes. So. <laughs> okay, so we could have spent an hour or so going through all those charts and and really had a good time there at Biggs Army Airfield, but we wanted to beat some, beat some storms that we're getting into uh, Beeville, so... We'd looked at the EPR, and when we when we uh, went to full power, um, we're on the roll, and I, I look over at it, and I hear from the back seat, do we have the right EPR? I go, hold on a second. So I lean over to the right and forward, take the parallax out, and I go, it looks good from this angle. And he goes, well, I'm, I'm not leaning over. Is that okay to lean over? I go, yes, it's fine to do that. You can do that. And I checked with the stand officer for A4s, a guy named uh, Jeffro. And he said, yeah, you know, he has 3,000 hours in the A4. And he says, if you're not leaning over looking at it, you're, you're going to abort a lot of takeoffs. So that's the right thing to do. Although I right. just... I didn't know that at the time. I just made that up. I was like, I want that number to be right. And it was. <laughs> so, so we're good. And now the question yep. is, can you even stop on that runway? Because, you know, you got all those refusal speeds, whether your speed brakes are out or in, your spoilers are up or down, blah, blah, blah. Well, go to the next page. And you can see that this airplane has a tail hook. So I don't care <laughs> really how long the runway is or what the refusal speed is because I can always lower the tail hook and take, go to the next page. Yeah. BIK. Bidirectional arresting gear. So, okay. Yeah. You could find out that, you know, you have 116 knots at the 11 board and you, if you abort, geez, if you were to abort at 160 knots, you'd still have plenty of room to stop. I mean, it's just not a big deal on that runway. But if you're get, really getting some problems, you can take that arresting gear. So go all the way to the last one, and I want to show you the, there you go. 
what is that all about? Well, as we're rolling down the runway, we're, you know, about 4,500 feet into it and the airplane wants to fly. The A4 has a, uh, a uh, um, have leading edge slats on them and they don't mm -hmm. always come out and go in together. So I let it stay on the okay. ground a little bit longer. And as you're on the ground, they'll push up. And as you rotate, they'll come back out and you want them to come out together. So you gotta be real smooth there. And then once you get airborne, sometimes they come out, sometimes they don't, sometimes they go back up and you know, it, it you, it's always kind of surprising. So it's kind it was kind of a pathetic takeoff run. That's why we were, we discussed the Eper on the way. So as I take off, it's not climbing at all. I slap the gear up just to get it clean. And we, I don't think we settled, but we were low and not climbing. Fortunately, the, the runway was falling away from us a little bit. And at the end of the runway, it fell off even quicker. So um, mm -hmm. we're taking off down there. And as we get to the end of the runway, I literally see a jackrabbit. And I, I'm just thinking to myself, as I'm as smooth as I can be at the end of the runway, please don't jump into the airplane. And off we went. <laughs> and, and that, it, it, it looks like the same one because he's looking at us and we're scared and he wants to, what the hell is that noise? <laughs> so but that Murphy's Law is about to take over. over. So, say that again, Hood. That's the story of the jackrabbit. Right. So like, where did it jump? Please tell me not down the engine. In I, it, it didn't move that I saw. It was just sitting on, on the ground. I, I'm not sure that it actually hurt us but uh, until we were past it. But I mean, it was just, I, I saw it as we got to the end of the runway and I'm like, oh no, please don't. I was worried about birds, but we didn't really see any birds. And then I saw the rabbit. And I'm like, this will be a bad, bad day. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine so, Easter Bunny ruins TA4J takeoff. Yeah. And then it was a smooth flight back, Sorry. no weather. And uh, it was all good. But that that's that was a more than more than average exciting takeoff. <laughs> I can go back to the screen now. Yeah, I must admit, I. Uh, my piloting experience is very limited, but seeing living creatures on the runway when you're going past them at high velocity is usually not very good from my experience. Right. So, right. Uh, but it didn't jump in and do anything drastic. I thought you were going to tell me it had jumped, it jumped in the engine or it had climbed in there while you guys were parked and you started it up and it went out the back. Nope. That did not happen. <laughs> okay. uh, now, I have taken some small birds in the engine and it literally smells like Thanksgiving in the in the cockpit. <laughs> Better than having a turkey go down there, I suppose, considering yeah, the size yeah. of the damn thing. The small birds, are, and they're like little wrens or something like that, s smaller than a fist. They'll leave a blood streak down the side of the intake, and and you can see, see feathers. But literally, you just roast them on the way through. Doesn't do any damage yeah. to to the engine. Uh. Because I always wondered about that. I mean, you, it's not like you can stick a big net up over the airfield and say, okay, no birds in here. How, how do you guys, you know, like, how do airfields protect against that? Um, yeah, that's a, there's a lot of research been done on that. Some places put barn owls up on posts in various places that apparently scare the birds. I don't know if that works or not. Some places uh, they uh, used to go out and they would fire shotguns uh, just prior to takeoff to, to scatter the birds, get them out of the way. But I'll tell mm -hmm. I think they've quit doing that. Um, and I'll tell you when I fly in and out of Chino, just east of here, well, about 50 miles east of here, sometimes there's, there's a cyclone of birds at the approach end of the runway. They're like, holy cow, am I going to make it through this? And they're at pattern altitude. They're up to 1,100 feet and just mm -hmm. flying around and uh you just have to miss them I, I have i have not hit a bird in southern california yet but i've been awful close at 
El Monte and at Chino. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and like you're mostly flying prop planes these days, is that correct? Right. Yeah. A little, little so, small would it bug smashers? Would it be uh, Would it be better hitting a bird with a prop plane than a jet? Like, I don't know. I just think a decent enough size enough bird, if it goes down the intake of a jet, it's got to bit do some pretty nasty damage, as opposed to smearing over your propeller, maybe. Well, the problem with the propeller is if you hit the bird with the propeller and you bend the propeller, you could right. you could get enough vibration to actually pull the engine off of the airplane. Or oh, if it geez. if it goes into the it misses the propeller or it's still it gets cut up by the propeller and it goes in the intake of you know the cooling ducts, you could have some yeah. issues. Or it could come through the windscreen. I mean, I don't know what the, the windscreens are tested for, but if you're going 100 knots and a bird comes smashing into that plexiglass, I don't know what if it'll just scatter or if it'll come through. I mean, I've seen I've seen birds come into Navy airplanes, but you know they're going 400 knots or something, and it, it becomes a brick at that point. But yeah. uh, I think that I think the biggest thing is if you if you unbalance the prop, it's bad. Bad juju, as they say. I remember reading somewhere years ago, and I don't know if this is true or not. Um, I think it was uh, the way, one of the ways they tested the maybe the cockpit plexiglass. I think they used to fire frozen chickens at them or something like that. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah, that's yeah. true. I've, I've seen the, the, the tapes of that, and the slow motion is kind of interesting because it'll hit the windscreen, and the windscreen will bulge into the cockpit but it won't break mm -hmm. in, in a lot of instances that that's they tested a lot of different speeds and and they get to the failure point where it does eventually come in but some of the other videos i've seen of, of people that have had pretty large birds come into their cockpit through the windscreen it is not a pleasant uh, event at all wow i can imagine yeah, I always looked at the F sixteen with it. Pretty sharp when it breaks and it cuts guys up and pokes out eyes. Yeah, and stuff, and then you got a bloody dead bird, or hopefully it's dead a bird all over you, <laughs> or flapping around ready. in the cockpit. Yeah, yeah. I, I always looked at the F sixteen because that was, I think, that was one of the first planes that had that all uh, like no canopy bows and uh, wondering just how strong is that material. I, I think the F-16 went through a whole lot of that kind of testing. Uh, there's probably mm. something on YouTube about that. Yeah, yeah. So I remember seeing maybe, maybe. I don't know what airplanes they were using in the test, though. So. Maybe they fired frozen chickens at it. <laughs> 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 so, cool. All right, well, thanks for that story, Huda. I'm just, uh, thankfully for you, you didn't get a rabbit joining you. That would have been right. pretty nasty. So I assume you guys got back home safely and missed the storms. We did. And a real a real quick wrap up, a landing story. Uh, and I'm, I'm throwing okay. this at you because uh, a, a guy asked me about this the other day. Uh, we I landed, uh, was taxiing off of the runway. I just pulled off of the runway. And as I'm taxiing, all of the lights on my caution panel come on and then everything goes out. And I hear over the radio while this is happening, 425, you're on, and smoke fills a cockpit. I'm like, oh, I must be on fire. So I, I get the canopy up, I pull the throttle back to shut it down, and I jump out of the airplane, which is not a fun thing to do in a TA-4J because it's, mm. you know, it's about eight feet off the ground. It's a kind of a far drop. Yeah, it's pretty hot. But, uh, I climbed out of it and it's smoking like hell and the fire guys come out and it didn't catch on fire. What had happened is the main bearing had let go and the the engine had kind of dropped down onto the engine casing and it started chewing up the, uh, the compressor blades and the turbine blades on the engine casing and the, the main bearing, because it ate itself, there was oil all over the place and it was just smoking, it wasn't burning. And uh, okay. at one point, they, the, the, the maintenance chief gave me a bag full of bearing parts. He goes, here, here you go. That's what you yeah. had I'm just glad it didn't happen 60 seconds earlier on short final. 
Yeah, yeah, that wouldn't have been fun. Um, I think I heard the something similar happened to an RWAF Hornet, or maybe it was a Growler, not that long ago, I seem to recall, on takeoff. So, yeah, no, no fun, but that's what ejection seats are for. That's right. So, and to right, mate, well, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> what happened with the F-35? <laughs> exactly. you know, it's, it's quite, it's really interesting. Like for many years, I've always said, you know, well, why do we need these two engines? But you know, they've always bought twin engine planes, that kind of stuff. They finally spend these trillion dollars putting an F-35 out, a single engine. So it'll be very interesting to see how many of them go down due to engine failure that wouldn't have had a problem if they'd had two. Well, have you seen the accident report for the uh, F-35 that crashed at uh, Eglin about, that's almost a year ago now? No, I don't a, think I have. It was a night ILS or something like that. Fairly good weather, not, not weather wasn't a factor, but the pilot's helmet was out of sync with the airplane and he was messing with oh, that yeah. and he got in a mode that it, it was kind of frightening to read about where the airplane didn't think it was landing so it wasn't behaving right and it had to do with him being fast on final and he basically while he was trying to take it around the airplane wanted to do something else and he jumped out of the airplane yeah i do remember that now um i didn't read the report but i remember reading something about it somewhere so yeah but i mean you and i are both in the technology space so we've got a, like an it background you know it is awesome when it works but it doesn't always work exactly exactly and so, mover lemoyne has that accident report on his mover mondays video thing that he does he did something about that did you say yeah, he, he's real good at taking accident reports as soon as they come out and having a discussion on his podcast or whatever you call those things, stream, yeah. YouTube channel, yep. YouTube channel, there you go. Yep, sounds good. All righty, beautiful. Hey, mate, great to talk to you and catch up again. Um, we'll have to talk Tomcats again next time we speak. All right, we can do that. Sounds and, good. Uh, All right, you have a fantastic, uh, it's what, it's got to be night time over there. What time is it? Oh, no, it's uh, late afternoon. It's uh, 6.30. Oh, okay. Oh, well, that's all right. You've got plenty of time to yeah. go now. So yeah. it's 9.30 a.m. on Thursday here, so I'm in the future. <laughs> oh, okay. There you go. I thought it was going to be 10 o'clock there. Uh, my my watch must, must not be working. Well, right. No, I, th I, th I think maybe we got the time zone adjustments wrong, but well. it's, uh, it's a nightmare trying to manage it, so... All righty. Well, mate, good to talk. You have a great day. Um, I'll catch you again soon. You too. Thanks a lot, mate. Have a good day.